Hey everyone, this is Noah Zerbe. Welcome back. In this video series, we look at the United Nations system. This video focuses in particular on the structure of the United Nations organization. So let's get started. The United Nations Charter outlines six principal organs within the organization. These are the General Assembly, or GA, which serves as the principal deliberative assembly of the United Nations. The Economic and Social Council, or ECOSOC, which focuses on international economic and social affairs and coordinates the activities of numerous UN specialized agencies and related bodies. The UN Security Council, which has primary responsibility for addressing threats to international peace and security. The Secretariat, which is the administrative arm of the United Nations and is responsible for managing the organization's day-to-day -day affairs. The Trusteeship Council, now largely defunct, was responsible for overseeing decolonization efforts. And finally, the International Court of Justice, which adjudicates disputes between states and is charged with offering legal opinions to the organization. Let's consider each of these in greater detail. The General Assembly is the primary deliberative body of the United Nations and is the only part of the United Nations where all states are equally represented with one state having one vote. According to the Charter, the General Assembly, or GA, is responsible for overseeing the UN budget, for appointing the Secretary General upon recommendation of the Security Council, for electing judges to the International Court of Justice, again upon recommendation of the Security Council, for approving new members of the United Nations, also on recommendation of the Security Council, for appointing non-permanent members to the Security Council, for receiving reports from other parts of the United Nations, for establishing subsidiary organizations as necessary, and for making recommendations through its resolutions. The majority of the work of the United Nations takes place through the five regional caucusing blocks. Resolutions, for example, generally begin in draft form within a regional caucusing block or even within a subgroup of that block. Because the size of the General Assembly makes participation of all member states in negotiations over every issue unwieldy, regional groups will sometimes designate a subset of countries as lead negotiators on behalf of the region on specific issues. To be clear, this is not always the case. Some issues are so important to specific countries that they may decide to participate on their own. But in general, regional groups divide the work between them. The African and West Europe, or the European Union groups, are particularly strong in this respect and often coordinate national positions within their own groups before approaching other regions, allowing them to present a unified and thus more powerful front. Regional groups are also influential in the selection of non-permanent members of the Security Council. The seats themselves are allocated on a regional basis, with three seats reserved for Africa, two for Asia and the Pacific, the Western European and Others group, which includes Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, have two seats, as does the Latin American and the Caribbean group. Eastern Europe has one seat. A similar geographic distribution is used for seats in the Economic and Social Council, the Human Rights Council, and other UN bodies. The President of the General Assembly is also filled on a rotating regional basis so that each region holds the presidency about one out of every five years. Regional groups have different approaches on how those seats are assigned. While an individual member cannot serve consecutive terms on the Security Council, it is not uncommon for more influential states like Japan or Germany to be elected to the Council on a more frequent basis than other states. Some regions decide amongst themselves which country they will put forward and then nominate only that single member, which is then confirmed by the General Assembly. Other regions are mo more open to competitive elections for the seat, permitting the General Assembly to decide. The groups themselves are not perfect, and several states don't fit easily within them. The Asia-Pacific group, for example, was called the Asian group until 2011. Non-Asian members of that group, particularly the island countries that comprise about 20% of the group's total membership, demanded a more inclusive name. China insisted that the group officially be called the Group of Asia and Pacific Small Island Developing States, but the shorter Asia-Pacific group is the more common designation. The United States has opted not to join any group, but caucuses with the Western European and others group. Israel would geographically be a member of the Asia-Pacific group along with most of the Middle East. However, its membership and participation in the group has been blocked by several Arab states. For years, 
it is informally participated with the Western European and Others group. In 2013, it was granted permanent status in that group. Turkey participates in both the West European and Others and the Asia Pacific group. However, for representation and voting purposes, it's a member of the West European and Others only. The Pacific Island state of Kiribati does not participate in any group, but would belong to the Asia Pacific group if it chose to participate. Officially, the General Assembly operates on the basis of majority voting, with the exception of certain important questions which require a two-thirds majority. These important questions are defined as those dealing with budgetary issues, questions dealing with peace and security, and the election, admission, suspension, or expulsion of UN members. With the exception of budgetary issues, which includes matters of spending and assessment of dues, and other important issues, the decisions of the General Assembly are recommendations. The General Assembly lacks the ability to enforce its decisions. Instead, the General Assembly's resolutions are recommendations to the member states and to other parts of the United Nations or to other international organizations to take specific actions. They are intended to express the general will and shared beliefs of the international community. As a result, there's a strong emphasis on consensus in the United Nations. A resolution passed unanimously carries much more weight than a resolution that passes by a narrow majority. Often, this means accepting a slower rate of progress in addressing issues in order to keep unanimous consent among the member states. It also means that the same resolution is often passed session after session with only minor changes to agreed language. The General Assembly is at its busiest in September of every year when general debate occurs. That's when the heads of state from around the world converge on New York to address the United Nations General Assembly. This event takes a couple of weeks, after which the regular work of the United Nations gets underway for the year. Because of the large number and variety of issues the General Assembly works on, most work actually takes place in the committees of the General Assembly. The most important of these committees are numbered 1 through 6. First committee is formally titled the Disarmament and International Security Committee, or DISEC. It is charged with addressing issues of peace and disarmament not currently under consideration by the Security Council. Second committee is formally titled the Economic and Financial Committee, or ECOFIN. It deals with economic questions, macroeconomic policy, financing for development, sustainable development, human settlements, the eradication of poverty, and the use of technology for development, among other issues. Third committee is formally titled the Social, Cultural, and Humanitarian Committee, or SOCOM. It deals primarily with questions of human rights and humanitarian affairs, including topics such as the advancement of women, the protection of children, the rights of indigenous communities, the treatment of refugees, and the protection of fundamental freedoms. Fourth committee is formally titled the Special Political and Decolonization Committee. It deals with a variety of political topics not falling under the jurisdiction of other committees. This represents a change in the charge of the committee, which was originally focused on questions of decolonization. As the number of non-self-governing territories declined, the work of the committee shifted, and the committee was used to offload the excessive workload from First Committee. Today, Fourth Committee deals with questions of decolonization, the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, problems faced by Palestinian refugees, peacekeeping and special political missions, landmines, the peaceful uses of outer space, and public information, among other topics. Fifth Committee is the organization's Administrative and Budget Committee. This committee meets from September through December and resumes its work in March and May due to heavy workload. The committee is responsible for approving and overseeing the United Nations administration and budget, including the budget for peacekeeping operations. Finally, Sixth Committee deals with legal issues. While the committee can deal with specific issues and pass resolutions like any other committee, it is also the primary negotiating arena for a number of international treaties, including the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations of 1961, the International Convention Against the Taking of Hostage Hostages of 1979, the Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court of 1998, and dozens of others. Each committee elects its own president, three vice presidents, and a rapporteur who reports on the work of the committee back to the General Assembly at the end of the session. In general, committees meet for one to two months after general debate, usually concluding their work by November of each year. All members of the United Nations have a seat and a vote on all, each of the GA committees. The second main charter body of the United Nations is the Economic and Social Council, or ECOSOC. 
ECOSOC is comprised of 54 members elected by the General Assembly to staggered three-year terms on a regional basis. ECOSOC is also unusual in the UN structure in that it provides consultative status to various non-governmental organizations. This gives those organizations the right to participate in the discussions of the body, but not to vote in its proceedings. ECOSOC's primary responsibility is to serve as the central forum for consideration of international economic and social issues and to formulate policy recommendations addressed to member states and the UN system on questions under their mandate. ECOSOC deals with a variety of issues. In this capacity, they oversee eight functional commissions, including the UN Statistical Commission, the Commission on, the po on Population and Development, the Commission on the Status of Women, and the Commission on Science and Technology for Development, among others. They also oversee five regional commissions focused on economic issues within the various regions of the world, three standing committees which coordinate work with non-governmental and inter intergovernmental organizations, and nine expert bodies addressing issues as diverse as public administration, the labeling of chemicals and dangerous goods, geospatial inf information management, and indigenous issues. In addition, ECOSOC is also responsible for coordinating the work of the various UN specialized agencies and with any other international organizations. Most of these specialized agencies operate autonomously with ECOSOC coordinating their policies and work. Most of these groups are functional in nature. They include groups like the International Labor Organization, the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, the International Telecommunications Union, the Universal Postal Union, and others. Finally, ECOSOC also holds annual meetings with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund to address issues of mutual concern, though it's important to note that neither of those two bodies are subsidiary to the United Nations. The third primary organ of the United Nations is the Security Council. The Security Council has primary responsibility for addressing threats to peace and security. Unlike other UN committees, the Security Council can be called into session at any time and members of the Council are expected to have permanent missions available year-round. The Security Council has 15 members. The five permanent members of the Security Council, China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, have veto power that applies to any substantive matter under consideration by the Council. This includes resolutions, the admission of new member states, and the appointment of the Secretary General the election of judges to the International Court of Justice, and other key issues. The 10 non-permanent or rotating members are elected by the General Assembly to staggered two-year terms on a regional basis. The presidency of the Council rotates monthly between the members, with each member serving a one-month term as president. Approval of any substantive matter requires a 9 15 majority. According to Article 27 of the UN Charter, Decisions also quite require great power unanimity. This provision grants the P5 their veto power. We'll return to the question of the veto power in a later video. In addressing threats to international peace and security, the Council can decide to operate under Chapter 6 or Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Chapter 6 provides for the implementation of measures short of the use of force. This generally includes investigations, reports, or non-binding recommendations. Under Chapter 7, the United Nations can authorize the use of force to counter aggression. Such measures can include diplomatic or economic sanctions, or even authorization of the use of military force. This is effectively the collective security mechanism of the United Nations, though we'll return to that a little later, and it looks a little different than that used under the League. The next major organ of the United Nations is the Secretariat. The Secretariat serves as the administrative arm of the United Nations, helping to organize meetings, provide support services like translation between the UN's six operating languages, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. It also develops reports and prepares the organization's budget. Comprised of more than 44,000 civil servants, members of the Secretariat staff are selected after completion of a UN-administered exam according to a rough quota system that ensures diversity of geographic representation. Secretariat staff are officially appointed by the Secretary General and serve at the Secretary General's discretion. While in service, they're responsible only to the organization and are expected to give up national loyalties during that service. The Secretary General oversees 10 offices, 8 departments, and 5 regional commissions, in addition to field offices in Geneva, Nairobi, and Vienna. There's very little real difference between offices and departments, and each covers various aspects of UN operations. 
Examples of offices include the Executive Office of the Secretary General, the Office of Internal Oversight, which en engages in audits, inspection, and monitoring of various aspects of the organization, the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, which monitors and reports on humanitarian crises, and the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Examples of departments include the Department of Political Affairs, which monitors global political developments and advises the Secretary General on international issues, as well as providing election assistance to states that require it. The Department of Peacekeeping Operations is responsible for the planning, preparation, and management of peacekeeping operations authorized by the UN Security Council. The Department of General Assembly and Conference Preparation oversees various meetings and provides conference services for UN meetings and the Department of Public Information, which acts as the public relations and communications arm of the United Nations. The Secretariat is headed by a Secretary General, currently Antonio Guterres. The Secretary General is elected by the General Assembly on recommendation of the Security Council. While there are a few official qualifications for the position, several unofficial criteria have emerged. By tradition, the appointee should not be a national of any P5 country, and due regard should be given to regional rotation of the office. Since 1981, the Security Council enters a closed session and votes in secret in a series of straw polls until a consensus candidate emerges. They then submit that name for ratification to the General Assembly. To date, the General Assembly has never rejected a proposed candidate. Secretaries General are appointed to a five-year term, historically renewed once. The only exception in recent history has been Boutros Boutros Ghali, whose re-election was opposed by the United States in 1996, limiting him to a single term in office. The responsibilities and powers of the Secretary General are actually quite limited and few in number. According to the mythology of the office, the first Secretary General warned his successor, Dag, Dag Hammarskjöld, you're about to undertake the most impossible job on earth. The Secretary General has the power to refer a matter to the Security Council for their consideration. Beyond that, most of their power rests in the ability to draw attention to important questions, to report on issues or initiatives, to carry out tasks assigned to them by the bodies of the UN, and to work with member states behind the scenes to influence decisions or negotiate outcomes. This process of helping solve international disputes by acting as an independent third party while offering substantive suggestions towards reaching agreement on settlement is usually referred to as the good offices. The Secretary General is assisted by a Deputy Secretary General who helps handle the administrative responsibilities of the office. In addition, there are a number of Under Secretaries General who are appointed in the same manner as the Secretary General and who serve as the head of various UN programs or commissions. The Secretary General can appoint special rapporteurs to represent them at meetings and to act as negotiators on behalf of the United Nations. These individuals are generally high-ranking diplomats who, as special representatives, have assigned portfolios addressing either a specific region or a specific global issue. Examples include a special representative for Somalia, a special representative for Iraq, a, a special representative on sexualized violence and conflict, a special representative on violence against children, and a special representative on food security and nutrition. It's perhaps easiest to think of these individuals as members of the Secretary General's extended cabinet. Finally, the Secretary General can appoint a special rapporteur to report on and draw attention to particular issues. Most frequently, special rapporteurs are charged with investigating or monitoring or reporting on specific human rights problems. Examples here could include special rapporteurs uh, on human rights appointed to Eritrea, Belarus, Cambodia, Myanmar, Sudan, Uzbekistan, among others. However, they can also have thematic mandates as well. Uh, examples of special rapporteurs with thematic mandates include the special rapporteur on the rights of persons with disabilities, the special rapporteur on a right to education, the special rapporteur on the right to food, uh, and a special rapporteur on the right of freedom of religion or belief. Antonio Guterres is the ninth Secretary General of the United Nations, having been elected into the position in 2017. He previously served as the Prime Minister of Portugal and had been the UN High Commissioner on Refugees. The first Secretary General of the United Nations was Trygiev Lee of Norway. Having represented Norway at the United Nations Conference in San Francisco, Lee was one of the lead authors in drafting the charter provisions for the Security Council. 
Most analyses suggest that Lee was actually a poor Secretary General and that he was unable to address several critical international crises during his tenure, including the Berlin blockade, the Korean War, and the expansion of UN member states. Lee was succeeded by arguably one of the most influential Secretaries General, Dag Hammarskjöld of Sweden. Ironically, Hammarskjöld was initially a consensus candidate, the least offensive option to the U.S. and the Soviet Union, after a number of other candidates for the position had been vetoed. Hammarskjöld's tenure as Secretary General was cut short when his plane crashed while on a peace negotiation mission in the Congo in September of 1961. There was considerable speculation during and after the crash that his plane may have been shot down, possibly by the CIA, MI6, South African, or Belgian interests. During his tenure as Secretary General, Hammarskjöld succeeded in professionalizing the Secretariat, worked to improve Arab-Israeli relations, negotiated the release of 11 U.S. pilots held by China after being shot down in the Korean War, oversaw the deployment of U.N. peacekeepers in the Middle East, dealt with the Suez Canal crisis, and worked to aid efforts towards decolonization in Africa. Utant was the first non-European selected for the position of Secretary General, a concession to the growing influence of the developing world in the United Nations in the 1960s. A national of Burma, now Myanmar, Tant was a prominent diplomat and negotiator, having served as the secretary of the 1955 Bandung Conference, a landmark international conference that led to the establishment of the non-aligned movement during the Cold War, as well as a special representative of the Secretary General on Algerian independence and later on the UN Congo Commission. As Secretary General, Tant was skilled at using his offices to facilitate international negotiations. He's credited with having played a central role in resolving the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 and in ending the Congo Civil War in 1963. He shepherded the expansion of UN membership to dozens of newly independent states, oversaw the creation of a number of specialized agencies, including the UN Development Program, the UN Institute for Training and Research, or UNITAR, and the UN Environment Program, or UNEP. In his second term as Secretary General, he became a strong critic of South African apartheid and of U.S. intervention in Vietnam. Despite this criticism, he remained on good terms with all P5 countries, a unique and challenging feat for Secretaries General. He was even invited to serve a third term, an invitation that Tant declined in no uncertain terms. Kurt Waldheim of Austria became the fourth Secretary General of the United Nations in 1972. Waldheim had been Austria's permanent representative to the United Nations and had previously served as Austria's foreign minister. While Waldheim oversaw a number of international conferences, including the UN Conference on the Environment in 1972 and the World Food Conference in 1974, he's largely remembered as an ineffective Secretary General. Indeed, his most famous legacy was the discovery after his tenure as Secretary General that he had served as an officer in the Wehrmacht in World War II and was implicated, though never convicted, of war crimes he committed by his former unit in Yugoslavia. As a result, while serving as President of Austria from 1986 to 1992, he was declared persona non grata by the United States and nearly every other country outside the Arab world. Waldheim's candidacy for a third term was strongly opposed by China, who favored Tanzania's Salim Ahmed. The U.S. and China entered a standoff, and vetoing repeated for 16 rounds, with the U.S. and China each vetoing the other's favored candidate. The standoff ended when both Ahmed and Waldheim withdrew from the race. At that point, Peru's Javier Perez de Coyar was elected. Prior to his election as Secretary General, Perez de Coyar had a distinguished career as a foreign service officer, including stints as Peru's representative to the Security Council, ambassador to France, and special representative of the Secretary General in Cyprus. He led negotiations between Argentina and the United Kingdom after the Falkland Island crisis in 1982, and facilitated negotiations that led to Namibia's independence in 1990. He also worked to address the situation in Western Sahara and the crisis in the former Yugoslavia. Boutros Boutros Ghali of Egypt served as the sixth Secretary General and led the organization through a tumultuous post-Cold War transition. Indeed, during his tenure, the UN suffered several critical setbacks, including the failure to address the Rwandan genocide, the failure to address war crimes and genocide in the former Yugoslavia, and the crisis in Somalia. Boutros Ghali did oversee the publication of An Agenda for Peace in 1992, a proposal to restructure UN peacekeeping operations for a post-Cold War world. 
Despite his short tenure in office, this report did expand the operational definition of peace, noting that the absence of war was insufficient and that any lasting peace had to address the instability in the economic, social, humanitarian, and ecological fields. The report also laid a clear distinction between peacekeeping and post-conflict rebuilding, a distinction that remains relevant even today. Boutros Ghali's application for the customary second term as Secretary General was vetoed by the United States, despite the fact that he was running unopposed and received 14 votes in favor of his candidacy in the Security Council. The United States refused to waver and vetoed his candidacy in four successive rounds. As a result, Boutros Ghali became the only Secretary General to be denied a second term. Kofi Annan of Ghana was elected as a compromise candidate following Boutros Ghali's rejection due to U.S. veto. Anand had worked his way up through the ranks of the United Nations, having never held a high-ranking diplomatic post for his home government, the only Secretary General to do so. Anand had worked for the World Health Organization and had been Under Secretary General for peacekeeping. During his tenure as Secretary General, Anand spearheaded a number of reforms intended to streamline the UN's dated bureaucracy and management practices. He also cut the size of UN staffing, reduced the UN budget, and improved outreach to civil society. Anand oversaw the drafting of the UN Millennium Development Goals in 2000, the UN Global Compact, which coordinated the public and private sectors also in 2000, and helped develop the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine. Anand was criticized for his handling of the oil for food scandal in Iraq. Despite this, Anand is generally remembered as a charismatic leader but weak manager, only achieving limited success in reforming the organization. Ban Ki-moon of South Korea was elected as the 8th Secretary General of the United Nations in 2007. Ban was one of the first people to actively campaign for the position and was originally considered a long shot. In the eight months leading up to the vote, Ban visited the 15 Security Council members officially in his capacity as South Korea's foreign minister, signing trade deals and announcing aid packages. The effort was a success, and when the voting occurred, Bon was approved in the first round by a vote of 14 to 0, with Japan abstaining. Bon was generally viewed as the opposite of Anon, an effective manager with little charisma. He did make history by appointing a record number of women to key leadership positions in his cabinet. He also undertook an, a series of bureaucratic reforms intended to address American concerns. He made all appointments five-year contracts subject to annual performance reviews, required that financial disclosures be made public, and streamlined administration of peacekeeping operations. Bonn also brought the question of LGBTQ rights into the United Nations, but he was criticized by UN staff, who opposed many of his administrative reforms for and for the, his handling of the Haitian cholera epidemic. Finally, the current Secretary General, elected in 2016, is Antonio Gutierrez of Portugal. Guterres had previously served as Prime Minister of Portugal and had been the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. His selection was controversial and somewhat of a surprise, as many observers were hoping to use the election cycle as an opportunity to elect the first female Secretary General. Guterres has made the Sustainable Development Goals a central focus of his efforts and has said that he will investigate both the Haitian cholera case and accusations of sexual assault by UN peacekeepers. The next institution in the UN system is the Trusteeship Council. The Council is an interesting body reflecting the history of the UN itself. When the United Nations was founded in 1945, the bulk of the world's population lived in colonies, non-self-governing territories. The job of the Trusteeship Council was to help prepare those colonies for independence. Membership in the Trusteeship Council was comprised of all UN members administering trust territories, the permanent five members of Security Council, and a number of other members necessary to ensure that the number of members not holding non-self-governing territories was equal to the number of those on the council who were. Thus, over time, the size of the council decreased, as did its workload, as more states achieved independence. The council was suspended in 1994 after Palau, the last non-self-governing territory, achieved independence. It continues to exist on paper because eliminating it would require reform of the UN Charter, a proposition made more complicated by proposals for UN Security Council reform. In theory, the body could be recalled by its president or by the General Assembly or Security Council. However, no meeting has been held since its suspension in 1994. The International Court of Justice, or ICJ, is the legal arm of the United Nations. Its purpose is to settle disputes between states, and it can give advisory opinions to UN organs or specialized agencies. 
The ICJ is located in The Hague, in the same building that was once home to the League of Nations Permanent Court of International Justice. The ICJ has 15 judges elected to nine-year terms by the General Assembly on recommendation of the Security Council. Terms are staggered so that five judges are elected every three years. By charter provision, no two judges may be of the same nationality. By tradition, judges are distributed on a geographic basis with five seats reserved for Western countries, three for African states, at least one of whom is a judge of Francophone civil law and one of Anglophone common law, and one from an Arab state, two from Eastern Europe, three from Asia Pacific, and two from Latin America and the Caribbean. By tradition, the P5 also always have a judge on the court. While judges are appointed by the General Assembly, they can be removed by a unanimous vote of the other judges on the ICJ. States that are a party to a dispute being heard by the International Court of Justice may also request to have an ad hoc judge appointed for the case if they do not already have a national on the court, potentially increasing the number of judges to 17 for an individual case. Because ad hoc judges almost always vote for the state that appointed them, they cancel one another out. The jurisdiction of the ICJ is unusual. For cases involving disputes between states, it has compulsory jurisdiction only if granted just such jurisdiction by the states who are party to the dispute. Thus, it's possible to withdraw from compulsory jurisdiction and abide by voluntary jurisdiction if a state is dissatisfied with the outcome of the case. This happened most famously in the case of Nicaragua versus the United States in 1986, when the ICJ ruled in favor of Nicaragua's claim that the U.S. had violated its sovereignty by mining its harbors. When the U.S. lost the case, it withdrew from the ICJ's compulsory jurisdiction. While there's no legal appeal process for the ICJ, states can request enforcement of decisions of the ICJ through the U.N. Security Council. Nicaragua's problem in the 1980s was that the U.S. could simply block enforcement of that action by vetoing any resolution. Nevertheless, the ICJ plays an important role in helping establish international norms and in interpreting, creating, and reinforcing international law. That concludes our consideration of the bodies that comprise the United Nations system. Be sure to check out the other videos on this channel for more information on the UN. Thanks everyone. Bye.